Thank you all for coming today's, to today's VIP Distinguished Speaker Series. My name is Lauren Petrosky, and I'm a committee member of the VIP Distinguished, Series Speakers, Distinguished Speaker Series Committee. Today we have Dean Tom, Gill Tom Gilligan, Dean of the Macomb School of Business, here to interview Michael Dow, Chairman, CEO, and Founder of Dow. We will begin tonight with a Q&A between Dean Gilligan and Mr. Dell, and then we will open up the floor for a Q&A with the audience. As you can see, there are two microphones there and there. After the interview is done, if you have a question, feel free to line up behind the microphone and be prepared to ask your question. I would like to remind everyone that the event does end promptly at six o'clock, so we would really appreciate it if all of you would refrain from leaving early. Um, also, Dell is having a reception afterwards, so anybody that can stay here, it would be really great, and we would really enjoy your company as we chat with Dell representatives. Finally, I would like to remind everyone to please silence your cell phones, because we don't want to have any interruptions. And now I'd like to turn the floor over to President Bill Powers, the president of the University of Texas. Well, thank you, and thank you, Lauren, and everyone here, good afternoon, and welcome to the Macomb School VIP Distinguished Speaker Series. And our featured speaker, as you know, this afternoon is Michael Dell. Like so many of you, I wake up every morning and start my day with the Dell name in front of me. <laughs> Michael, we're honored to have you back on the campus. Thank you. We like to think that this is where your future began. And for those of you who aren't familiar with his biography, Michael did launch his idea for the personal computer and the personal computer business right next door in a dorm room in Dolby Center when he was a UT freshman. In his book, Direct from Dale, Strategies that Revolutionized an Industry, he wrote the following. I'm sure if I'd had the time to ask, Plenty of people would have told me that my idea wouldn't have worked. I've heard that a lot since starting the business. Sometimes it's better not to ask or to listen when people tell you something can't be done. I didn't ask for permission or approval. I just went ahead and did it. The business that began in a dorm room in 1984 with $1,000 and a bathtub full of spare computer parts, is now a Fortune 50 company with revenues of more than $60 billion. Dell ships 140,000 systems a day. That's more than one every second. The Dell brand is recognized worldwide. But after 25 years of enormous global success, Michael still hasn't forgotten his old school. UT has been the beneficiary of Michael and Susan Dell's remarkable generosity. The Dells have supported several of our colleges and our programs with a special focus on children's health and education, business, engineering, and the fine arts. Two of the Dells' most recent gifts to UT will support pediatric research and computer science. The Dell Pediat Pediatric Research Institute will provide a center for the research of critical health issues for children. And the Dell Computer Science Hall will support UT's ambition to have the premier department of computer sciences in the nation. Michael, I want to thank you and Susan uh, for your partnership with UT on so many important initiatives. We are very grateful for your support, your friendship, you. and your generosity. And I want to also thank you for being a living Slog, uh, example of our slogan, what starts here changes the world. We're delighted to have you back on campus. We're always delighted to have you back on campus and especially to address this audience of young entrepreneurs. Welcome home. Thank you. And here to facilitate this evening's discussion is Tom Gilligan, Dean of the Macomb School of Business. 
Prior to coming, becoming dean in 2008, Tom Gilligan served in several key administrative roles at the Marshall School of Business at the University of Southern California. He's also taught at Stanford, Northwestern University, and the California Institute of Technology. His areas of expertise are microeconomics, applied price theory, industrial organization, and antitrust economics. He's been an editor of various journals that focus on economics, management, and business. And he served as staff economist at the Council of Economic Advisors in the White House. And we are blessed to have him on our campus. The McComb School and the whole university are very fortunate to have a leader of his caliber taking our business school to the highest level of national prominence. Please welcome Dean Gilligan. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thank you very much. Right. Well, thank you, President Powers, and, and welcome all of you to today's interview with Michael Dell. Uh, Michael, your, your start here at UT is legendary. I think everybody knows about it. Could you tell us a little bit about your life prior to that, though? What was your first job, and what spawned your interest in commercial activity? Well, um, you know, my, my first job, let's say, outside of the house, um, well, I was 12 years old, and I worked at a Chinese restaurant. Mm -hmm. It's a true story. <laughs> um, and I got uh, recruited away to a Mexican restaurant. Really? Wow. Uh, where I was made uh, assistant maitre d'. Wow. At age 13. Wow, that's impressive. So I was really moving fast. But, yeah. but uh, um, I, I'd say my, my first you know, real job, in, in, at least in a, in a more conventional definition, when I was um, 16, my, my job prospects expanded because I was able to drive. You know, and that expanded the, the potential you know, job opportunities mm. pretty significantly. And I got a job with a uh, uh, local newspaper in Houston. Mm -hmm. And my job was to sell subscriptions. Mm -hmm. And um, it turns out I, I was supposed to do this over the phone. And um, I observed that people buying the newspaper uh, had two common characteristics. Mm -hmm. One is that they were moving into a new place to live, mm -hmm. or they were getting married. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that you can get a lot of information about people that are moving into a new place to live because they have to apply for a mortgage, and yeah. that information is actually available. And in the state of Texas, when you want to get married, you have to apply for a marriage license and when you apply, you have to put the address where you want the license sent. Mm -hmm. And so I created a direct mail campaign to send an offer to subscribe to the paper to all the people in the 16 counties surrounding uh, Travis County, where uh, Houston was, to subscribe to the paper. And it, it worked out really, really well. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> so it was kind of an early learning in, uh, in direct marketing. Did the newspaper company adopt your marketing model after that? You know, I'm not really sure what happened after that. They, they, they actually got uh, sold to the Chronicle and got merged in. So it was one of those consolidation stories. I you know, don't really know what happened after that. Interesting. So. Could you explain to everybody uh, what uh, generated your interest in computers and IT at an early stage in your life? Yeah, well, you know, for, for the generation that, that's here, uh, you, know, you, you know, computers have been kind of a part of your lives, uh, you know, uh, since the beginning. Um, I was actually pretty fortunate for my generation to get the opportunity to use a computer uh, in the seventh grade. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it wasn't even a personal computer. I was in an advanced math class and at my public high school in, in Houston, uh, my math teacher got the only teletype terminal at Johnston Junior High School, now Johnston Middle School. Mm -hmm. And you type in a program, and you send it off, and back comes the answer. I got pretty fascinated with that. I thought that was really interesting, and, and 
started writing programs and playing around with this, this computer mm -hmm. as much as I could. And uh, so, you know, th 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 that was kind of in seventh grade when I, when I uh, kind of first got interested uh, and had actually the first opportunity to, to use a computer. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I want to segue more to the current um, day and ask you some personal questions. Who, who do you most admire uh, in the contemporary political environment or just the world generally? Whose behavior do you think students should inspect and emulate? You know, unfortunately, I wouldn't. I wouldn't look to the political sphere. Uh, you, know. <laughs> um, you know, when 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 I think about you know who do I admire, it's probably more traits that I admire. Mm -hmm. You know, I tend to admire people who who have overcome great adversity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people who have set out to you know, do something that was really challenging, mm -hmm. you know, uh, inventors, people who built businesses uh, you know, in, in the face of great challenge, uh, people who achieved you know, great things you know, really in any sphere mm -hmm. um, in the face of great challenge. I, I, I was in uh, New York City uh, about two or three months ago, and I went to a school right in the middle of Harlem, and it was the first day of, of school, and uh, a place called the Harlem Academy. Mm -hmm. And they have done amazing things in, in this school and, and driven amazing results. And so, you know, I have great admiration for the, the person running the school and the teachers and even the kids, you know, and, and, and the parents involved. I mean, you kind of look at that and you say, this is really excellent, outstanding mm -hmm. things going on in a, you know, otherwise pretty tough environment. Mm -hmm. Interesting. What, uh, another personal question. What elements of your style, either personal or professional, are you still working on? What, what parts of you are you trying to change to become a better man? Well, I think, I think we can always uh, improve. Um, you know, um, for me, I think uh, there, there are, um, you know, uh, a, a couple things. Um, you know, I I tend to uh, you know jump to the answer you know pretty quickly, uh, and um, uh, don't have as much patience in 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 the process, and and uh, um, you know probably need to be more respectful of of the process you know in 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 some cases. Um, you know, I think. Uh, Understanding that that there are you know different styles out there, different mm -hmm. things that motivate people, um, and you know how do you connect with very different uh, kinds of people, you know, uh, in you know very uh, you know d uh, different audiences, mm -hmm. and um, you know we, we we we've we've had a lot of good fortune as a company. Mm -hmm. Uh, but no company has kind of unabated success. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, how do you uh, kind of keep people excited and motivated as you go through challenging times? And, right. you know, we've had any number of periods in Dell where we've gone through challenging times and had to kind of reset and regroup. Uh, and, you know, th those, are, those are always kind of times of reflection where you say, hey, what could we have done differently sure. and what could we learn? Um, you know, could we have made decisions earlier that would have uh, avoided, you know, some problems? Uh, you know, but at, at the end of the day, you know, you, you can't live, you know, uh, reflecting too much on, on the past. Sure. You gotta kinda move forward and deal with what you've got today and, yeah. and, and kinda, kinda move ahead. What, 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 what I try to do is surround myself with a very talented group of people mm -hmm. who have a diverse set of skills and, and backgrounds uh, you know that that can help us continue to evolve because yeah. it's a it's a business where as we were talking about earlier, you know you you change or you die. Yeah. And in, in, in a business like ours, it's true in every business, but yeah. especially true in a fast cycle business where the you know solutions and ingredients and uh, you know dynamics are really shifting quickly. Yeah. Yeah. The I want to segue to Dell here this, with this following kind of question. You can answer this in the personal realm or at Dell. What, what are, what's the biggest mistake you've ever made in your career? And what's your greatest accomplishment? 
you know, I've, I've made a lot of mistakes. Yeah. Um, fortunately, none of them have been, you know, too, too bad, uh, yeah. you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, they've usually been things that we could correct relatively quickly, yeah. uh, you know, you know as, as we were growing very, very fast. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we, you know, made the mistake of kind of going into too many things too quickly, and we kind of had to pull back from that. Um, you know, you, you could also argue the other side that says, hey, maybe if you hadn't experimented in all those things, you yeah. wouldn't have found, you know, so many new opportunities. I think, uh, you know, we certainly had plenty of misadventures where we, you know, went down the wrong path right. and, and, and learned. Uh, there have also been instances where we had success in a, in a particular mode of doing things. The environment kind of changed, but we sort of stuck with the old way for a bit yeah. too long. And we were too slow to, to kind of react, and, and now you have to go back and speed up the pace of change. Um, but you know, I, I, I don't tend to don't tend to live with a bunch of regrets. I, you know, we, 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 we look at our business and the the tens of millions of customers we serve and the you know way we're helping those customers thrive every day and the opportunities that we have to continue to do that. And it you know gets us really excited about our work and the the opportunities ahead. What about greatest accomplishment? Well, what's on the mantle right in the middle above your fireplace? You know, when, w one of the things that really gets me excited is when I see how, how much the, you know, capabilities that we've brought uh, to our customers have changed their ability mm -hmm. to thrive and do the things that are important to them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Dell has played a, a pretty unique role in the industry in that we were a company that kind of liberated value in, in, in a sense. and. Uh, brought the cost of computing way, way down mm -hmm. and kicked off a whole wave of efficiency that mm -hmm. uh, drove the, you know, the availability of computing in a global you know, scale. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you think about how many institutions, businesses, hospitals, uh, you know, schools, individuals, scientists, artists, you know, architects, et cetera, that that mm -hmm. you know, impacted yeah. It's, a, it's an incredible uh, you know, body of work. Yeah. What I also get really excited about is, you know, right now, there's an enormous amount of computing power that mm -hmm. we're right at the center of being able to deliver to mm -hmm. scientists and engineers and researchers. And that's increasing at a, at a pretty you know, uh, logarithmic you know, mm -hmm. rate in terms of the, the improvement. And they're able to solve the world's greatest challenges at an ever increasing faster pace. So, you know, uh, not to not to mistake us for the scientists and engineers that are solving the problems, but we do have the opportunity to deliver the, the power sure. that's going to go solve all of these problems. And we think that's pretty exciting. I'm also very excited about the, the work that uh, my wife and I have been able to do in our foundation. Yeah. You know, we think we think that's we think that's pretty cool. We think yeah. that's a lot of fun, and and uh, you know, able to touch a lot of lives that way. And then just one more. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I get excited when 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 I see uh, how people in our in our company uh, how their lives have changed and improved. Sure. It's more evident, particularly when you when you go to emerging countries, yeah. and you see, hey, you know. How have the lives of the people that are associated with Dell in China and India dramatically improved in the last 10 years because of our uh, you know, in involvement? And it's pretty significant. Mm -hmm. Amazing. I'm going to ask one more question, then we'll have the questions from the audience. Uh, there are a lot of students out here, young people. What's the best advice you ever received, and what kind of advice would you give students? Um, I think, you know, uh, pretty simple advice, it was uh, Dr. George Kosmetsky, mm -hmm. and he said, if you, you know, find a problem, fix it as fast as you find it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, always tried to, to, to stick to that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, George was, was uh, uh, kind enough to, to lend a lot of advice to, to me and to the company. Uh, you know, when we were an itty-bitty tiny company, mm -hmm. 
And, uh, you know, of course, he, he had a big role on campus here for, yeah. for many, many years. One of years. my predecessors a long time That's ago. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Got it. It's amazing. Same advice you'd give to the students today? Well, uh, cer certainly, you know, I, I think if you're if you're you know trying to run a business, that's yeah. that's that's pretty good advice. Yeah. Um, you know, um, you know, starting out in, in terms of uh, you know career, I mean, I, I you know I, I would say, uh, you know, don't be afraid to to make a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> go go. You know, uh, the, the way you learn is you make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Just don't make the same one over and over again. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, if you're trying to build a new business or start a new business, uh, this is particularly important. Mm -hmm. You know, I find a lot of people fall in this trap of of coming up with the perfect plan, mm -hmm. and there, there is no perfect plan. Mm -hmm. Just go and <laughs> start start learning, start iterating, and uh, you know. You, you'll know ten times more after you get started than you know wh while you're planning. Mm -hmm. Interesting, good advice. Uh, well, now we come to the time for public questions. Here, there are two microphones in the aisles. If you'd like to ask Michael a question, please queue up at one of the microphones. Uh, we're going to start with a question from Jessica Allen, who's a senior uh, majoring in finance. Jessica, great. Thanks for being with us here tonight. Um, during the weeks following the Dell Perot merger, the financial world was above with what this means in the IT industry. Can you tell us more about the merger acquisition and how you think it will change IT and the role of IT services in the industry as a revenue creator? Sure. We, we have um, just last week completed the acquisition of Perot Systems and together uh, the new Dell Services is an $8 billion services firm with about 40,000 people. You know, what, what we have seen in our business is a continual uh, evolution from kind of uh, customers wanting products to wanting pro uh, uh, services to wanting solutions. And what that really means is that when we go to a customer and we say, hey, we've got a new Blade server and it has this many gigabytes and terabytes and you know it has this kind of throughput and you know uh, there's some customers who say oh yeah give that's really geek out we love that um, but a lot of the customers say you know I, what I'm really doing is I'm doing an ERP system or supply chain management or customer relationship management and I'm trying to run my hospital or my school district or uh, my manufacturing company or my aerospace company, and what do you actually know about my business? And if, if you know something about my business and you can help me solve this problem, then I want to talk to you. If, if you don't, then you know, go away and leave me alone. You know? So we, we, we have been on this path of really learning more about our customers and then building solutions to help them be more efficient and solve the problems that are really relevant mm -hmm. for them. Um, so you know, Pro Systems brings a significant uh, capability in that solutions development, solutions capability, adding new capabilities in application development, business process outsourcing, uh, you know, complete IT outsourcing, managed services, infrastructure management, and combining the, the, the Dell services uh, capability with Pro Systems, you know, we, we have uh, a much more complete uh, solution that we can bring to our customers. They also have, have had some real expertise in healthcare, uh, where, where they've been kind of uh, leader in, 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 that, in that sector of IT. Uh, we, we also worked with them for many years and done a lot together and found the cultures to be, uh, you know, very compatible and so, you know, very happy with, uh, you know, seeing our businesses come together. Thank you. Let's go to this side of the room. Hi, Mr. Dell. Um, my name is Kirsten Hayes. I'm a freshman here at UT, and I want to start up my own computer company as well. Um, <laughs> well uh, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> the idea came to me about a couple of years ago, and I literally am ambitious to go out and start my own company, and not only to distribute to the consumer, but also 
make the computers and also distribute it to underprivileged kids who don't have the money to pay for laptops themselves or PCs. What advice would you give me personally in order to go out and start up my own company? Well, um, you know, I think you know, if you know if 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 you want to uh, start a company, uh, I think you know uh, what I what I would say is first of all, experiment is is a good idea. You know, um, experiment, test new ideas, test things, uh, and like I talked about earlier, don't wait for the perfect plan. You know, I would say you, you've got to identify. What is it that's that's really unique and different that's going to cause uh, customers to really want, uh, you know, what you're providing, and what unmet need is out there that hasn't been fulfilled, uh, that creates a, a new space and a new opportunity, of whatever, you know, size that may be, and you know, one of the advantages that a new person has looking at a, at a business that's been around for a while, is they tend to have you know, uh, those new ideas. And they don't tend to think in the constructs and the paradigms and, you know, things that have been well exercised within an industry. Um, you know, I think, I think uh, you know, also when there's a lot of change, that, that's when there's opportunity because there's, there are transitions to new technology architectures, new ways of selling. And so you've got to find uh, you know, something that is going to be really distinctly different, uh, but you might not know exactly what that is. So, so, you know, you go experiment, try a couple different things and see, you know, what may work. Thank you very much. <clears throat> sure. Yes, sir. Hello. Uh, my name is John Cancino, and I'm actually the Dell rep here on campus, so I just want to say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, John. How you uh, I have a few questions. Um, how do you handle your awesomeness? <laughs> <laughs> let me clarify, let me clarify. Um, um, well, how do you handle your work uh, with your family and your friends? How do you balance that all? I was talking with some of the students about this earlier today, mm -hmm. and you know, um, when I started, uh, you know, I was working like seven days a week, you know, pretty much until I fell down and went to sleep. And um, you know what I learned along the way is that there's actually a limit to the number of hours you can work and be productive, you know, in a given day or week. What I also learned is that you know if you don't have some kind of balance uh, in your life with your family, uh, you know, your work, you know, physical exercise, time for recharging your batteries, and you know, relaxing. Uh, you know, you can't actually sustain any activity for any length of time. So you have to find that, that right cadence that works for you. Uh, and, you know, I, I think I've got that working reasonably well. Um, and so that, 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 that's important. And, and so you've got to kind of set aside time to, to uh, you know, do all the other things because you can consume, you know, your life can be consumed you know, with, with uh, requests and, and uh, uh, infinite uh, number of opportunities. Um, and when you're, when you're leading an organization, it also, you know, gets to be about priorities and, you know, uh, dividing and conquering, you know, different uh, opportunities and tasks and not trying to do everything yourself. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, John, how many how many questions do you have? I have about three, two more questions. One more question. We have a lot of people that want to ask questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, what do you think about the startup company uh, Lightermate? I met the I was able to meet the president um, a few, uh, back at ACL, and um, <laughs> and uh, he he calls himself a mechanism company. I was wondering if I should invest or not or. I would say, you know, if you're going to invest in in, uh, in in venture companies, I'd be pretty careful. Uh, I'd either either make sure you know a lot about it. Um, uh, you know, you know, the, if, if if you look at if you look at the technology industry, uh, there's kind of the rule of five, okay. which is for all the thousands of new companies that get started every year, about five of them become really important companies. 
-hmm. it's, it's really hard to, uh, you know, become a, a, a really significant company, uh, you know, in, 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 in the technology industry that goes public, raises lots of capital, and, and really, you know, uh, makes a big difference. I don't know a lot about that company, so I, I can't really give you okay. any, any financial advice about that. All right, um, I have check, can I have one more question. This is the most important question, actually. <laughs> I actually had to get permission from my professor to be here, and this is for you and President Powers, if he's still here. Uh, President Powers was the one that reminded me of you being here, and um, so he, she wanted me to ask, since I had to get permission, if you would come speak at our class, but <laughs> if you can't, <laughs> so. We'll uh, defer the answer till later, All right. okay? All right, thanks, John. <laughs> Thank we'll you. Hi, Mr. Dell. Uh, my name is Alan Goldstein. I'm a third year MPA here. Uh, I have to start off by filling, fulfilling a request. Dennis Passavoy, I don't know, he was a former employee, he said to say hello to Michael, so he says hello. Okay, um, say hello back. I yeah, will do. So my specific question is, I've read a few articles about Dell's entrance into the smartphone market, uh, specifically through China Mobile, which is, you know, China's a very competitive cell phone market. What's sort of the strategy with Dell coming in this late into such a competitive market, and what are some of the long-term goals of the smartphone? Sure. Well, you know, since we're here in the in the AT and T Center, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you know, with all due respect to our friends at AT and T, uh, I think AT and T is the 16th largest cell phone carrier in the world. Um, I think the largest is, is China Mobile, and um, China Mobile has lots of products that they sell. One of the products they sell are netbooks uh, with wireless connections. You know, over half of those are Dell, so we have a pretty good relationship with China Mobile, and we're doing some unique things for them. I think the bigger story is that there are about four billion people in the world who have cell phones, and the vast majority of those are not smart cell phones. Now, most of you probably have a smart cell phone, but most of the four billion people, overall the majority of them have, for lack of a better phrase, let's call it a dumb cell phone, okay? And I would suggest that in the next five years, most of those four billion people are gonna say, you know what, I don't want a dumb cell phone anymore. I want a smart cell phone. I wanna be able to do, you know, Facebook and, Twitter and you know I want to you know check the sports scores and I want to know what the weather is and I want to you know do this and that and I want to run apps and so I think there's going to be a, uh, a you know a, a lot of opportunity in that space and it's really just kind of at the beginning of that so you know you'll you'll see us uh, you know participating in that area uh, so stay tuned. Hey, Mr. Dell, it's a pleasure to learn from you and be from here. My name is Jake Benson. I'm a junior here. I go to McCombs here at the UT Business School. Um, I was really wanting to know what do you think is the most exciting uh, emerging technology right now? Because uh, I'm kind of an entrepreneur myself, um, I guess if you were my age right now, where would you be looking for opportunities? Yeah, I think there's a couple of different uh, ways of thinking about that. I mean, you can you could look at the at the geographic level and say, you know, what countries are you know interesting in terms of markets and places where new things are happening. Uh, you could look at it by you know industry sector and say, you know, is it is it financial? Is it healthcare? Is it manufacturing? Uh, you could also look at technology ingredients. You know, is it, is it going to be software? Is it going to be hardware? Is it going to be networking? Is it going to be, you know, a combination of those things? I mean, the the, the ones that kind of you know hit the radar for for me, um, you know, two thirds of the world's population lives in Asia. Uh, Ninety six percent of the world's population doesn't live in America, uh, and so I think there's some really interesting things going on, uh, you know, in the emerging countries. China certainly gets a lot of attention as it should, but there are other really interesting emerging countries. I was in Brazil last week. You know, there's a lot of uh, interesting things happening there in terms of growth. In terms of the, uh, you know, kind of uh, vertical areas, um, 
you know, technology is actually at the fulcrum of solving a lot of the big problems in the world, whether it's kind of energy, healthcare, education, lots of uh, big problems that haven't been solved. And I think if you can, if you can help solve one of those problems, yeah, there's a, a great big market. Um, you know, uh, and, and, then, and then when you, when you look at the horizontal level, you know, hardware, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty hard. It's pretty hard to get in the hardware business, um, it, you know, these days. You see fewer and fewer new hardware companies. Not to say it's impossible, but, but uh, software is a lot more interesting because, you know, software can be virtualized. It can be delivered over the web. And so you see a lot of new software companies and it's pretty easy to create a a gadget or an applet company, and you see a lot of uh, new new businesses being created uh, that way. Um, so lots of choices, and and again, uh, you know, new people have the have have a very fresh perspective, and they'll often identify completely new opportunities that you know established firms like Adele, uh, you know, uh, wouldn't see. Now we try to make it our business to understand those and, and be out in front of those. Um, but uh, you know, any, anytime you have a business this dynamic, there are always going to be new firms creating new things. There's a company here in Austin called LifeSize that just got bought by uh, Logitech. Uh, you know, very clever bunch of uh, folks and created a great product, uh, and you know, been growing very fast. Thank you. Hey, Michael. I'm Robert from El Paso, Texas. What was your biggest drive as a young entrepreneur? And how'd you leverage others to work with you? You know, my, my biggest drive was the opportunity that I saw. I just, I just saw that, uh, you know, the, that, you know, the, the PC at the time, you know, was gonna play a huge role in how business and medicine and education was going to was going to evolve and i saw uh, you know a, a huge opportunity and it was a global opportunity incredibly exciting you know dell in its first 8 years grew 80% per year compounded and in the 6 years after that it grew 60% per year and if you do the math on that you know no matter what number you start with it ends up to be a very large number <laughs> uh, you know, uh, after after that, uh, and so you know, um, we were really driven by the opportunity we saw, the feedback we got from customers. Our direct model gave us a, an incredible, you know, uh, ability to listen to customers and understand, you know, what their what their you know, what their needs are. Good evening. My name is Julia Jensen. I'm actually an international student here at UT. And first of all, I want to express my gratitude for the way you're giving back to UT. I think it's truly amazing. I have never had that experience back at home. Hmm. And I listened Thank to many you. leaders at the beginning of the semester until now. And I was wondering, how would you describe your personal leadership style? And what is effective leadership for you? You know, um, I, I don't try to spend a lot of time describing my style. That's, uh, that's, How are you that's probably the first part of my style. But, uh, okay. but if, I, if I was forced to, uh, you know, <laughs> um, you know I'm, I'm pretty results oriented. Um, I'd say it's a fact based approach. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, um, it's, it's, a, it's a style of, of uh, you know, uh, asking a lot of questions and trying to understand the problem, um, you know, it's it's a it's a style of uh, you know, kind of trust but verify. You know, let's get the very best people we can, and you know, really spend a lot of time clearly identifying what we're supposed to be doing, and uh, you know, and 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 let's let's uh, have a periodic you know way of making sure we're actually doing it. And then also have a periodic way of, of, of kind of uh, saying, you know, are we really going after the right goals here? And what should the benchmarks be? And, you know, what are the new things that are changing? And, you know, I look for 
uh, you know, the team that, that's with me to, to you know, to, to, you know it, it, I, I see it as a collective leadership. You know, I think a lot of people look at businesses and they over ascribe things to you know, one person or two people you know, at the top of an organization. It's really not the way organizations work. Um, so that gives you at least a sense. Thank you very much. Sure. Good evening. I actually have a question for Dean Gilligan and you, Michael. My name is Lydia Frain. Uh, I work for you. I'm the brand manager for consumer desktops in the direct business. But I'm also originally from El Salvador. I started with Dell in El Salvador. Hmm. And I transferred over. I had the opportunity. And I'm also a UT alumna, so I graduated from the executive program this semester, this past semester. So my question to the two of you is, are there any plans to enable higher education and tie that with employment in third world countries? We, we have uh, executive, uh, non-degree executive programs and executive MBA programs in Mexico and partnerships in Brazil and those areas. Uh, those are the outreaches we have at the time and, and we're always looking for new business. So we're happy to entertain the opportunities we have to partner up with uh, companies or other educational institutions in third world countries. We're beginning to explore partnerships with schools in China uh, who bring their MBA students over here for short periods of time uh, to partake of all the assets we have here at UT too. So like Michael, as with Dell, it's an opportunity for us too to expand our educational opportunity, uh, our opportunities abroad. And what I would say, as, as a global company that wants to drive you know, even more of its growth outside the United States, we are particularly interested in uh, you know, people joining the company who weren't born in the United States and understand the cultures and the, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, the, the, the way uh, you know, other places in the world really work at a very, very deep level and can help us apply our business and our solutions you know, in, in those places. We think that you know, our U.S. business is gonna continue to grow but we think our business outside the U.S. will grow a lot faster, you know, over the next 10 years. And so, uh, you know, we have a great interest in you know, talent like yourself and, and others uh, who, who, who want to join the company and, and be part of a, a really a global company. You know, we, we happen to be based here, but, you know, more and more of our business is all over the world. Right. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Dell. My name is Cora Griffin, and I'm a senior here in, in the business school. And my question pertains to the company culture at Dell, because it seems to play such a prominent success factor with um, in successful companies. So I was wondering how you implement and communicate Dell's corporate culture throughout all of your international locations to all of the employees so that they share the same values and goals. It's a great question. I think one of the um, important things about uh, culture is, is this element of kind of values and ethics. And it's very important because, uh, you know, while we are, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, a, a global company, we, we actually have one culture when it comes to, you know, uh, kind of how we do business, particularly in values and ethics. And it's very, very important that you explicitly communicate that because, the values and ethics you find in other uh, countries are not always the same as the ones that you know, we may be used to in, in this country. So we're pretty, very explicit about uh, you know, those things. Uh, certainly from a kind of what do we value in our leaders and uh, as we develop our organization, uh, those things also become you know, very explicit. Uh, the, the training and development programs are global ones. And in fact, our businesses are now organized to be global businesses where we think about uh, our customers globally. We think about you know, what do small and medium business customers need around the world or what do uh, you know, K through 12 organizations need or higher education uh, need. And that gives us really unique insights that, that, that we can share. But, there, there, you know, there, there's lots of ways to communicate that. Um, you know, you communicate it through town hall meetings, you communicate it through actions, 
you know, obviously there, there are all sorts of uh, training and, and those kind of things. It really comes down to uh, the actions that occur, you know, inside the culture and, you know, the, the, the small work groups and the managers and team leaders uh, that, are, that are kind of, uh, you know, uh, driving, you know, activity and making sure that those are consistent with the company strategy and ethics and beliefs. Um, I'll give you an example. We have at Dell a big culture around volunteerism and community involvement. And so we have at Dell uh, a, a, you know, a whole process of, um, you know, community in involvement that's global. And so uh, roughly every September we'll have 40 to 50% of our workforce participate in community volunteer activities everywhere in the world. And, uh, you know, we'll celebrate that and we'll encourage it and we'll give them, you know, time from their daily work to go and do that. And it becomes, you know, it's part of the culture of, of Dell. Even though it may not be the culture in every country that we, we go to, it becomes part of the culture of Dell and we encourage that and we, we sort of uh, drive that. Uh, so, you know, I think, uh, and, and, and I would say it's, it's distinctly different from, from an American culture. It's a, it's a Dell culture that is, that is global. Thank you. Uh, Michael, thank you. I'm a uh, UT finance undergrad, and I got my MBA here at UT while working at Dell. So I've been there for, I was there for eight years. And without Dell, I just wanted to thank you first because uh, I'm on my fourth company, multi-million dollar company. I couldn't have done it without you guys. I mean, really, um, being around Dell and the people there, it really taught me really that if you can run with people at Dell, you can do anything. And so thank you. <laughs> um, I really thank appreciate you. that. Um, my question is, is you've kind of built an incredible legacy in the first part of your life, but you got half of your life left. What? Um, That's good news. Only half? What are you talking about? <laughs> Unless you, your you technology to figures here? out a way to make you uh, stay young forever. Two, really, two questions in that. Number one is, what keeps you up at night in the next 10 years for Dell or something else that you're like, that's so big, like a big, hairy, audacious goal that you're like, we have got to get here and we're going to. And number two is, over the next half of your life, how do you top the first half? <laughs> Well, you know, in, in, our, in our business, you don't really have to look too far to see the challenges and the opportunities. You look at what's going on in the data center with virtualization, with wireless, with, you know, small devices, with fourth generation networks. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the, the element of change and opportunity that, you know, arises uh, as you have, you know, hundreds of millions of new people coming online and massive amounts of data moving onto the internet and you know, whole businesses really going from analog to digital and the whole media business is shifting over and information, uh, you know, it, it, it's just an enormous opportunity. So we got plenty of opportunity uh, and you know, we see our job as kind of making all that work really well for customers, helping them thrive in the things that you know, are important to them, uh, and that's kind of what we've, that's how we've succeeded, uh, you know, in, in large part to, to, to get to the size and scale that we are, and I think it'll play a huge role for us going forward. Um, in terms of, of uh, you know, for, for me, uh, you know, I, I, I want to lead Dell to, to help it, you know, reach that full potential. Um, but, you know, my, my wife and I also have this family foundation, and we've kind of set a goal for ourselves to say, hey, let's figure out how we make a bigger impact on the world through the foundation than we have through Dell, the company. Uh, and, we, you know, we, we, foundation's only 10 years old, so got to give it a little time. But, you know, I think we're off to a pretty good start, and, you know, we're coming up with some really, uh, I think, in incredible uh, Ideas and programs, uh, you know, you know, um, th that are catalyzing a lot of change, whether it's in education or healthcare, 
uh, and not just in this country, but around the world. So it's a big, it's a big challenge, and it's not something that's going to happen quickly, but uh, it's something that gets us pretty excited. Thank you. Great. Over here, please. How intimidating was it when you first started out when it came to selling your products, and how did you deal with that? I don't remember it being all that intimidating. Um, you know, um, we just kind of started. You know, <laughs> and uh, um, you know, uh, you know, if you don't have a lot to lose, then you know, failure is no big deal, right? So, so uh, um, you know, w you know, when I started the company, it, you know, it, w it wasn't as if anybody was really paying attention, uh, and, and so you know, just kind of start. And uh, um, and uh, you know, learn by making mistakes. Learn learn by doing. Um, you know, we actually started by uh, selling upgrades to computers, and then started you know, kind of making our own computers. And the business grew very very fast. Thank you. Please. Hi, it's been a joy listening to you today. But um, you mentioned in your achievements that one of them is seeing how. Dell's uh, benefited the emerging countries, and I was just curious how this has um, influenced and shaped your social responsibility policies. You know, I think, I think um, companies uh, have a, an incredibly important role to play in, in society, and if you look at this from a Dell standpoint, uh, you can see it you know, weave through many, many different aspects of what we do. Um, you know, in, in terms of, you know, green IT and, and kind of environmental uh, things, uh, you know, some fairly uh, big kind of industry leading um, activities. So, you know, we spent a lot of time thinking about our products and we said, hey, you know, if we're making 50 million things a year, what happens at the end, you know, when people stop using them? Where do they go? What kind of materials go in them? And how do we make sure that they're, they're the right materials, they're clean materials, they can be recycled? How do we dramatically lower the power consumption? So we were the first you know, big computer company to offer free recycling, to be carbon neutral as a company. You know, we were able to take down the power consumption. If you think about a typical computer we would have sold four years ago, it used about $100 of energy per year, whereas now a new Dell Latitude notebook uses about $7 of energy per year. So we really dramatically took the power consumption down. And then we said to our suppliers, after we're carbon neutral, well, what are your carbon emissions? And we're actually going to measure you in our supplier scorecard on how green you are. And so we started influencing their activities and created a kind of competition among suppliers uh, to use fewer resources. And this actually saved a lot of costs. I'll, I'll give you one final story about this. Uh, we had this great meeting at Dell called the Sustainability Meeting. And um, you know, people come with ideas, and they say, hey, we should change this, and how about this? And a uh, guy comes to the meeting, and he says, OK, here's two catalogs. You know, See if you can tell the difference. Like looking at the catalogs, where's Waldo? We can't really figure it out. <laughs> and uh, he said, okay, we give up. Tell us. And you know, th the answer was, you know, well, this one is recycled paper and this one's not. Okay, great. So tell us about recycled paper. Well, you know, it's costs about the same and uh, actually exactly the same. And you know, here's all the reasons why this is better. And so he said, great. Let's go recycle paper. So we do that. About six months later, same guy comes back and he says, OK, we've done all recycled paper. This is great. Um, I think, uh, Michael, you ought to send a letter to the top 25 companies in the world that use paper in catalogs and encourage them to do the same. And I said, that's a really good idea. We'll, we'll use recycled paper. We'll send them that, that letter. <laughs> and so we sent out this letter. <laughs> and within about five months, there's a worldwide shortage of recycled paper. <laughs> uh, and, and so now, you know, you, you got to go build more factories to recycle paper. But, um, you know, again, when, when, when you think about the 
the uh, effect of causing all of our suppliers uh, and all of our competitors to kind of react to Dell's the first to be carbon neutral. Dell's pr products have lower power consumption. You know, uh, you know, you know. Dell's the first to do you know free recycling. It actually kicks off a wave of positive competition that you know can really uh, you know dr dr drive some positive effects. What I also find is our, is our our people in the company get really excited about these things. They have a lot of energy for them, and they're, they're really proud. You know. Uh, that, that, that they're a part of those activities. Interesting, great. Thank you. Well, Michael, regrettably, that's all the time we have for our program today. I want to thank all of you for your questions. It, it was, they were very interesting. I want to turn the program back over to Lauren, who will do a brief gift ceremony. Thank you, Dean Gilligan. And thank you so much, Mr. Dahl, for coming out and speaking with us tonight. We really enjoyed learning about your past and the, all of your experiences, and we'll definitely be taking your advice and applying it towards our future and our careers. Hopefully someday some of us can be as successful as you were. Um, well, you guys have been in t school too long, you know, so that's the... <laughs> <laughs> Get that. out, no. no. Um, You're cut. Now, we'd also like to business. thank the Undergraduate <laughs> Business Council, the Office of Student Life, Corporate Relationships Management, and the Dell team for helping to put on this event. And as a reminder to everyone who may be able to stay afterwards, Dell is hosting a reception where there will be plenty of food, uh, drinks, and Dell representatives to talk to. And finally, as a token of our appreciation, Mr. Dell, we'd like to present you with this personalized belt buckle. Wow. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. And um, thank you guys for coming out tonight. Great full house. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Very nice. Very kind of you.